Hello. Hello. Are we are we specifically wearing black to be a witch? Yes. <laughs> no, you know what I realized this morning when I was getting dressed? How do I love Halloween so much and I don't have deliciously tacky Halloween earrings? Oh, fuck. I'm going to have to fix that. Look, I, I, I speak wife. Apparently, I'm now buying <laughs> No, 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 no. You don't pick them out. Let you. me, oh let me pick them out, please. It doesn't end with you, woman. Are you ever happy? I think I think every man in the world. No, I need like some skeletons or some little. There's plenty like, of those in my closet. Or... <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I like that joke. That was good. Yeah, Thank yeah. you for setting me up, babe. <laughs> um, Aztec Chevrolet taking care of us as always. Always on top of it. Always taking care of us. Always good people. I do know that right now, and I hate to say it, they have a Ford Bronco on the lot that <gasps> just came in. So by the time you see this podcast, it, it might be sold. But uh, Aztec Chevrolet, give them an opportunity. Please, please, please. Old Salt Coffee, if you get a subscription, um, we will send you, uh, we, we, we hope to send you <laughs> a challenge coin. We will send you a At, challenge coin. If, if you have not yet received your challenge coin, please email us at oldsaltcoffee.com. And we will get it out as soon as possible. And again, my apologies. We're working on it. And then, of course, Picked Cherries. Picked Cherries is an app that I need you to download on your phone. Whether you use it or not, it helps us. It's fun. It's a cool it's a way to app. discover new new podcasts and yes, listen ad free. Whoa, they closed the, the thing. Now there's a... Who closed it? I did. Well, now it makes a reflection, I think. Does it? Rick, do we need to we, fix that? No, no, it's okay. It's okay. There it is. Yeah, no, it looks good. Okay. I just, I, you know, Jeff, um, our friend Jeff... Uh, Steel, he mm -hmm. brought me a bunch of challenge coins and I just not yet have had the From opportunity yeah, to share so those. Many. I got another one in two in Denver that I need to share. And I just, we were running by the seat of our pants. I know. I was like throwing up decorations. I'm not done. I'm not done, but it's a good start. The whole family went to Denver um, this weekend. And I got to tell you, man, I, as Denver is beautiful. Yeah. And I love being in Denver. It just kicks my ass. The the altitude sickness, the dehydration, and and, and I get You've there. Talked about it before. You have yeah. like a system to keep you functioning. Man, I get there and I, I get the uh, an IV right away to help me hydrate. Yeah. But man, I mean, you, I just it's not enough to. Well, it has been in the past where I have gotten altitude sickness so bad that I'm just like I feel sick and run down. Yeah. This time I got it, but it wasn't enough to take me out of the game. Yeah. Like I was still, you know, but you just. You still had a drink. <laughs> I still had a drink or two, but I, you still feel like you're dragging ass, man. Do you know what? I didn't realize it until we got home. And then usually on travel days, we're really tired and out of it. And we got home yesterday and I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go here. I'm going to get this done. Because you can breathe again. I, I just, we got home yesterday and I just felt better and but, I had more like, energy. Even poor Garrett, he was all dressed up. He wanted to sing. Um, and we all go to the show on Thursday, the first day that we're there. And then all of a sudden you just see him like. He and then he <laughs> fell asleep in the green room before eight o'clock, which is unheard of for that kid. Yeah. That kid is like me. He wants to be awake. He wants to be up. He Garrett part, has know. never fallen asleep in a green room. And, and by ever. the way, Tons of action. Yeah, right? it was full of people. Full of people. Kids passed out in the corner. And he just he couldn't do it. And and it just Delilah was beating him in the face with chicken strips. The shows were phenomenal. Yeah. Um, the scenery was beautiful. We went to the zoo. We went to Hammond's candy factory. Yeah. Uh, which was really cool. I, I've never seen I, I don't know if I didn't know that candy was made that way. Really? How did I, you think it was made? Well, the candy canes, like it comes out, it's this fat. Yeah. And then they literally string it out, cut it with scissors, and then turn it into a, a, well, a I think, candy Well, weren't they saying they're one of the few factories that still, like, they, hand... I mean, they use machines, but, like, hand makes their candy. Yes, they still make it the way they made it hundreds of years ago. So it was really cool to go over there and visit those guys. I, I, I do think they can do a better job. Oh, of the, of the tour. Well, it's a free tour. Like we were there not and there was the, a huge group of girls. Not so much the or, tour, but oh. like when you walk into the gift shop, you know, I, I, I'm, and I'm so used to 
when you go to Vegas, yeah, and, and what's the cookie? The oh, there's Sugar Factory. Sugar or Factory. It's sugar. Or, yeah. And you walk in there, and it looks like uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, yes. and it's beautiful, and there's candy everywhere, and there's all these displays and and yeah. cool places to take pictures. This was not that at all, and, yeah. and I felt like. I mean, you, you're, you know what it is. They even need, cause it's like, cause it is old fashioned handmade candy. They need like Chip and Joanna Gaines or like studio McGee to come in there and like zhuzh up their store. Well, I would have loved to go in there and, and, and it looked like a old, um, pharmacy. Yes. That's what right? I mean. Yeah. Like, like an old soda shop. Yeah. Like an old soda shop where you walk yeah. in and there's a counter and there's the, the, the pop, we got pop in the back, yeah. you know, the um, old cash register, the big metal cash right, register. You know, yeah. Something like that because it is an old fashioned candy place, and we we ended up spending so much money on on candy, but um, we loved it. And and Denver, God, I love it. And and one of the things that I really love about the comedy, well, first of all, Comedy Works downtown, one of the best comedy clubs in the world. It's in a basement, ceilings are low, it's tiered up, people are tight. Anything you could ever ask for for a comedy club, uh-huh. they have it. They recreated that on the south side where we were, or east side, or wherever we were. South side, we're in the south side. Yeah. Um, so it's still an amazing club, but my favorite thing about it mm-hmm. is that they lock your phone up. Oh, I noticed that when the kids and I were coming up in the evening. They hand you a bag. When uh-huh. you sit down at your table, you put your phone in the bag. Boom, they lock it up. If you want to use it, you then have to go back outside. They unlock it for you. They let you use it. You come back in the showroom, lock it back up. Afterwards, when you're doing meet and greet, do people complain about that? No. Having no. to lock up their phone? You know, and, and for me, is and, and what, what people do not understand, and I know that, that Patton Oswalt has gone off about this. Mm-hmm. I know that Dave Chappelle has gone off about this. What people do not understand is that when a stand-up goes on stage, sometimes we're working on new material. Right, we're working on material that nobody has ever seen before, and it's not cooked. It's not ready. Yeah. Right. So it's very frustrating when I'm on stage and people are going Facebook Live, and it's like, hey, man, I make my living putting out my specials for then people to consume. But if you're doing it for free, right? And and I don't mind free. That's okay because I do put it out there in social media for, for it to be free, but now it's low quality, the sound is bad, and the joke's not ready and not yeah. done, right? What's well, the same idea as like people doing this in a movie theater? It drives me crazy. Yeah. And, and what people don't understand is not only it's a distraction for me on stage, and then I'm concerned, and then my club act and my theater act is different than when I want to film it. Yeah. Right, when I want to film it, by then, the, the, the bits are thought out, they're done, they're finished. I, I know exactly how I want to tell them and release them to the public in good quality yeah. and with good sound. And now you're filming me and I might, I mean, again, there's a bit that I do that in the beginning when I told the bit was not, it, my, my message was not coming across correctly. Yeah. So if somebody recorded me and put it out there four months ago then the message that I that because again figuring out the wording figuring out how I want to say it and then now you got your stupid phone out you're not watching the show you're distracting me you're distracting the people around you and you're infringing on my talent and what I do for living right right so and, and then you know not to mention how many times I'm on stage, and if they're not filming, it's a dark room. Then I see somebody texting, right? And then their yeah. face, their face is lit up, and they're checking their phone, and they're texting, trying to watch the show. And by the way, I get it. We all have babysitters. Yeah, I was going to say, right? yeah. How, however, get up, go outside, check your messages. That would be you know, my. That would be like my anxiety as a mom in the showroom. Like if the sitter needed to text me and I didn't get that text. Then, then again, like I said, every, you know, before, um, you go to the restroom or something, right. Take a moment to go out there. Check in. Show's about to start. Check in, I guess. Right? Yeah. Um, but I love, love, love that, that the comedy works does that. And I honestly think that it, it leads to 
a better experience for everybody. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ideally, everyone's like engaged in the show. Yeah. I totally understand. That's exactly how I feel when I'm putting up my uh, Halloween decorations and you want to film before they're done. (laughs) But, you know, with that being said, uh, we're Oh, wait, just real quick, too, before we move on. Um, Hammonds, Deb, I think it was Debbie Ray was the sweet lady who said, who recommended that we go and do that in Denver. And we were looking for something to do. So thank you, Debbie. Yes, thank you, Debbie. Um, well, now you got me all distracted. I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's okay. I don't mind. Um, well, no, because you know we were talking about the fact that, that... By the way, Rick, did you know that they have that technology to lock up the phones? Yes, sir. I love it. We need to do that for my next special. Is, is turn your phone in or lock it up yeah. and let's do it, right? So with that being said, I know and I hope... I hope Rick is prepared. Uh Last episode, we said that we would give Rick the floor to ask us uh, comedy-related questions. So this episode is a special episode where producer Rick gets to ask the questions that he wants to ask. So go ahead, Rick. All right. I think you should um, rephrase my question in case, you know, sometimes my voice doesn't come out on the mics. Okay. Okay. First question. And this is going to go out of order of career. And I think in fairness, we'll ask one question to you and then one to Renee. First question for you, Steve. First joke you ever told on stage. Do you remember it? And what was it? Ooh, okay. So Rick is asking, first joke I ever told on stage. Do I remember? And what was it? Now that gets very complicated because I have been doing stand-up since I was a child. Yeah. So what that does is it, it, it so my first, what's really interesting to me you know, there are memories in your life that you remember forever, right? There yeah. are moments, you know, I don't remember a lot about second grade, right? But I have memories, right, of second grade. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the memories that I remember is that that I wanted to try out for Miss Mute, who, by the way, is a beautiful lady and a wonderful music teacher. And she was in charge of the talent show. And I wanted to do be a stand-up comedian. Mm -hmm. Now, what's weird, and I don't think I've ever told you this, there was a fourth grade kid also auditioning to be a stand-up. Yeah. Which, and I don't remember his name, but I remember he was, he was older than me. He went up first and I watched him and then I went up and I was. (laughs) Were you like, I'm going to kill it. Oh yeah. And, and, (laughs) and I recited uh, a little bit of Eddie Murphy raw (laughs) And I remember Miss Mute sitting me down and goes, listen, um, those jokes are not going to work. So why don't, she goes, why don't me and you work on some jokes that are appropriate uh-huh. for a, whatever second grade oh, is, an eight year old, right? Mute. Yeah. Um, so then I, I, one of the jokes I'll never, rem- I'll never forget was if bread had feet, what kind of shoes would they wear? Loafers. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So that was one of my, f- you know, first jokes that i remember miss mute had put together a routine for me and why don't we never teach that joke to garrett when he used to tell jokes that yeah that's, so a, that's a good one and then but then i remember um i remember the first bit that i wrote myself uh-huh. because every year after that and every talent show that we did i was a stand-up comic right yeah. and even in in fourth and fifth grade and sixth grade our fifth and sixth grade they actually let me host the the whole talent show. Oh no way! Yes, Miss Elliot, Miss Elliot, uh, another oh, I another Miss Elliot, wonderful woman. Yeah, and Miss Elliot would let me host, right? And I'd come out, and I'm like, hey, you know, she'd be like, okay, you do a monologue, you do a little stand up, <laughs> you know, and then you you get to host. Uh, oh, I so wish we had video of we that. We do. I'm sure your dad does. Your dad go has to. Those old VHS yes. Tapes. So uh, one of the first bits that I wrote was I always knew I was in trouble with my parents when they used my real name. Because, you know, my name is Steve and always has been Steve. Yes. However, my legal name is Esteban. Uh I didn't know my name was Esteban until kinder were doing roll call and they go Esteban Trevino and I'm looking around like, man, there's another Trevino here. And the backstory on that was my, my father was drunk when I was born and was not there to name me. 
and then my mom named me Esteban <laughs> without my dad's without my dad knowing. My dad hated the name Esteban. Yeah. He goes, fuck that. I'm going to call him Steve. I remember your mom saying too, she got it from a Spanish, from a novella soap yeah. opera that she watched. So my whole life I was Steve, right? Yeah. Um, and then later on I found out that my, my real name, my legal name is Esteban, right? Um, so that was one of the first bits that I wrote is I go, I, I remember going, you know, I know that if I'm in trouble, my mom will go, Esteban! And I'm like, oh, no, I'm in trouble, right? Uh -huh. Esteban, if you fall off that tree and break your legs, you better not come running to me, right? That was, yeah. that, so that was the first bit that I wrote, and it was probably fifth grade, uh -huh. and it, it, that was the first bit. So there you go, Rick. So in fifth grade was when you started writing dope. Yes, writing my yeah. own material. Next question. All right, Renee, I've asked you this multiple times throughout the years. Steve's jokes could be viewed as crossing the line when the subject matter is you. However, have your parents, brothers, or brother or sisters talked to you about Steve's jokes, saying they may cross the line? Yes. Yeah, we've had this conversation. Um, the the joke was I don't even remember how it goes now, but it was were we engaged yet? Do you remember? You're just looking at me like the, the we we were either engaged. Well, I, I want you to answer, but then not. I have okay. comments on yeah, it yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Steve's better memory is way better than mine. But Steve used to do a joke about we had our dog Jax, and you used to do a joke about you being so gross that the dog would throw no, up no, when that, he when we would have sex. Do you no, remember this? Yes, but that wasn't the joke. The joke. Was, <laughs> the the joke was that there's nothing worse than having a dog. And while you're having sex, it decides to throw up. And now it's over there in the corner. And then the, I forget how the joke went, but it was like, that's all I need is my dog over there in the corner. Barfing you know, at the side of me. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And you do the whole reenactment. It was actually a really funny bit. It got a great laugh. Well, because the disgusting thing about Jax, our dog, he was always eating Renee's panties. If Renee left her panties out, he would eat them. Yeah, and then I'd throw them in the trash, and he'd get them, he'd get them out, out of the trash. And then he would throw them. And, like, yeah. and yeah. then I used to say that it was like a, like a, 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 a I was like a, a fucked up magician, you know, pulling her, <laughs> her panty out, right? Uh, but <laughs> like the scarves. Yeah. Um, anyway, but that joke made my parents so uncomfortable, and I think like. Maybe one time they heard, they got wind of the fact because my mom owns a hair salon and um, one or two of the local priests go there to get their hair done. And I think maybe there might have been a priest going to the show or something. And so my parents were like, can you please just not say that joke at the show? No, it wasn't like that. There was, there was, we had, we had a very rough go, if we're being honest. On oh, even podcast. before that, I think. We, we had a very rough go um, with Renee and I dating and, and. You know, and if I'm being honest on the podcast, her parents did not like me and they did not like the material and the things I would do on stage. And, and there is a time in a marriage where, and, and I, and I understand cause I am a parent now and I, and I understand it, it's hard because when they say a father gives his daughter away, yeah, it now means so much more meaning because you understand it differently, you mean? No, it, you you truly have to give your daughter away. You are no longer in charge of your daughter's life. You are no longer um you are no longer the 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 number one uh you know influence on your daughter. You're kind of touching right? on this a little bit in your act now too. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you know, when you, when they say you are giving your daughter away, yeah. it truly means that, Hey, we now have our own family and we have to make decisions for our family. Number one first, and then our parents second. Yeah. And I think that there was a really hard transition for your dad, especially when it came to that, and I finally, you know, because he would get upset about it or I'm not going to the show. And, my brother and, too. And your brother too, yeah. you know. And I'm not going to the show and hear you talk about my daughter, you know, blah, 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 blah. They and, took it very personally. Yes. And finally, um, both Renee and I uh, pulled them aside and said, we 
are happy. We have no problem with the act, you know. But the act has also changed. I think it was I think it was two things. Yeah, at one point I think my my dad and my brother and even my mom just did not feel good about it at all. But I also think that that was when we were living in California and we saw them maybe at Thanksgiving and Christmas and one time in the summer. And, 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 and they got to spend time with us as a couple and get to know and see our dynamic. And, and again, they you know, they 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 would get upset and we really had to let them know, and you especially, and you had to go, look, I am not, I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. So if I don't have a problem with it, you shouldn't have a problem with it. Yeah. And I, fi- I remember telling your dad, you know, at one point, I go, don't come. I don't care. If you don't want to come, don't come. But do not call me and bitch and yell at me because you don't have that right. But it you was know. it was also hard for the. I mean, we we live in a very small at at the time a small town, a very small community where we are both from. My dad works at the one we used to work at the one post I get office, it. and it's hard. My mom you works know. in a beauty salon that's Gossip Central, and they I think were getting a lot of questions about it and didn't know how to field it. And when you when I came but, to but them it, and it, said it was, I'm cool with this, I think then they knew how to answer all those. Well, questions. And, and in the beginning, when I was younger, it was it was a little more harsh and it was raunchy a little and, little raunchier and and you know. But there's an evolution too of of my stand up and the things that we've gone through. So uh, there has only been one time that Renee came to me uh, and and by the way, I, you know, I was just talking about this to um, in Denver to a couple of guys that were asking me about my show and my act where I said, you know, Renee has been a big moral compass in the act. You know, there are times that you've come to me and said, you know, Steve, that, that just sounds really chauvinistic or that does not sound like I contribute. It's great for the joke, but it's not an accurate reflection of who you are. Right. So, you know, Renee has been a big guidance on, Hey, out from the female perspective, hey, that's mean or that's really gross, you know. And, and there was one bit that Renee goes, God, it's so gross. Don't do it. And I hated it because it was so fucking you funny. You loved it so much. No, I hated that you made me get rid of it because it was so funny. Um, but, but, I, but that was also a moment where I go, you know what? You're right. And, and if Renee thinks it's gross because Renee has a great <laughs> sense of humor, a great sense of humor and, and, a, and a lot of tolerance and thick skin, and for you to come to me and go, number one, hey, get rid of that joke. It's too chauvinistic. Number two, um, you're not giving me any credit, right, as a partner in our relationship. And then number three, that one's gross. So there, there, uh, Renee has been, Rick, a, a huge guidance. But I also don't do it often. Like, it is, it is your art, and it is your voice, and it is your view and perspective. And whether or not I agree with it or think it's accurate, it's yours. But, but uh, to answer that question, your, Renee's parents have come a long way. We all get along. We're all great. We all, we're all in on it. Um, her brother has come a long way. And, and like anything else in my life, I have earned my respect. I have shown them over the years that I love my wife. I take care of my wife. I take care of my family. I work hard. And over time, I always say, Doing the right thing plus time yeah. equals respect. And I have earned my respect by continuing to do the right thing and time going by where I have stayed consistent in my... That um, feels like such a Trevinoism. What? <laughs> what you just said. Doing the right thing plus time equals respect. That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, so next question. All right. You always talk about the great places you've been. Give me your worst place. What's the hell gig that you had to perform Ooh. in? Oh my gosh, dude. I, I have. I think one comes to mind and I wasn't there. I Which just one? remember you talking about it. Um, during COVID, having to do the drive in comedy shows. Oh, I've had so many tough, tough, tough gigs that were just hell. And, and the drive in's not that bad, you know, compared to, <clears throat> you know, in the beginning. I mean, this guy had this comedy club and, and or he was trying to start this comedy club and middle in Odessa and, and he calls me and he says, Hey, you know, we want come headline. I'm like, Oh, okay, great. You know, yeah. uh, this was early, early on in my career. I, I show up and it is like an old rundown Chinese buffet restaurant. They had put a twin bed behind the stage for me to stay at. 
No, I was like, yes. why do you need a twin bed behind the stage? That's where I was staying. That was the accommodations for the weekend. Holy cow. They had hung in the kitchen. They had put a water hose with a, um, like a water, uh, watering nozzle on it. Right. Over a drain. And that was my shot. <gasps> and I'm, I get there and I'm like, um, what is this? And he's like, well, this is where you're staying. I'm like, what do you mean this is where I'm staying? It's like 30 people came to each show. I only stayed there one night because I was like, fuck this. Yeah. I'm getting a, a hotel room. So I sprung for like a, a shitty Motel 6, you know, shitty hotel. Yeah. Not even a Motel 6. A Motel <laughs> 6 is nice compared yeah. to uh, where I stayed. But it was just one of the worst gig I've ever done. So it, that... That might answer your question. Did he continue to, to be a comedy club owner, I wonder? Uh, he's still <laughs> around, that guy. Yeah? Next question, sir. All right. Uh, Renee, how have you seen, after hearing that story especially, how have you seen Steve not just professionally change, but change throughout the years from when you guys first started this journey to where you are now? How have you seen him change? How has Steve changed personally or professionally since we've been together gosh that's such a i mean you've you have grown and changed so much we just talked about like how your comedy has changed you used to be a lot more raunchy um it used to be like living the single life like a pirate we talk about this now even just this weekend with the kids in the green room the vibe in the green room is so much different when you've got two kiddos running around eating chicken strips and pizza um, than when everyone's taking fireball shots. Uh, look, I have been, I, I am the, uh, you know, I'm the, I mean, if you, and there are several family members and friends that, that are like, thank God for Renee, because I was on a path of, of destruction. I was on a path of, you know, constantly getting in trouble, constantly going. I mean, I, I think I've been to jail in four different states. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, you know how it's changed? I used to, when the phone would ring in the middle of the night, answer it because always, because I, <laughs> there was a really good chance it could be Steve's one phone call <laughs> and I needed to pick up. I don't have that worry at all anymore. No, I, you know, I've, I've grown and changed and, and, and I tell people all the time, you know, you're in love when you're willing to change, you know, and I, and I tell people that. You know, there were plenty of women before Renee and they'd be like, if you don't change your ways, I'm leaving. And I'd be like, bye, I'm going to be me and I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And I don't give a fuck. And when Renee came, you know, I, I fell in love. And, and it, again, that's why the material in the beginning was, I hate you for making me fall in love with you. Because, man, I had this in my head, what I thought life was about at that time yeah you know that you came into my life and took away the the partying and the chasing and the drinking and the the bar fights and the you know i and, mean there were still a few and, of those <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Uh, but i've grown up a lot and and i've changed a lot and the stand-up has grown and changed and but i also think that that's what has become appealing about what we do because i think a lot of men feel the way i do a lot of men now go, man, the guy I was to the guy I am now because of my wife, because of my family. Kids, right? Kids change. Has, has, has made me a much different man, right? Yeah. So I think that's why the stand-up works is because there's a people see me and they know that I'm rough around the edges. They know that I'm a pirate. They know that I'm not quite right in the head. And they go, man, this guy is okay being in love with this woman, even though he's frustrated with all the things that she does throughout the day. So I think that, that that's part of the special sauce is that, that, that number one, the audience can see that I love you. And then they can also see that, that I changed. So I think that's part of the special sauce. Yeah. So next question, sir. Payment look like when you're 
first started, and I'm not saying you have to put numbers behind it, but everyone struggles when you first start out. Like, how do you get to the beginning, not have a second job or third job, and then if you did have that, how did that change from going full time? That's such a hard, tricky, complicated question. You want to you want to re 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 um, reiterate the question? How do I turn stand up into a full time job? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. And I have been lucky and blessed enough to be doing stand up full time since I was 22 years old. And I took a very blue collar approach to it to where I will not turn down a gig. I will do every gig. And, 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 and Rick, in the beginning, when you are 22, 23, 24, 25, you don't need much. And I didn't have much, which is, you know, when I moved to Los Angeles, man, I thought, okay, I'm going to move to LA. I'm going to get an apartment and life's going to be great. I found myself living in a, in a Walmart parking lot in Rancho Cucamonga uh, with a gym membership. So I could shower for uh, gosh, probably almost four months. But when you're young, and I always tell people, that's when you take those risks when you're young because you don't need much. I was not, I didn't have to support a you girlfriend. I didn't have responsibilities family. to a family. You know, you're also somewhat healthy, so you really don't need health insurance. And man, I just took a, a blue collar approach to it that I am going to do everything I can do. Number one, at that time, I was also, I found myself on the road with a famous comedian and I, my goal was I need this job and I'm going to be irreplaceable. That was my goal. It, I got something good here. The guy's taking me on the road almost every single week to where I can do stand up and I can collect the check and I can pay what little bills I have. There's no way that I'm going to let this person who took me on the road replace me. So I turned into, they used to call me the road manager for the road manager. I mean, I'm talking about back then, we would do radio in the morning. I had the minivan outside, already running, ready to go. The headliner that, that I worked with liked Diet Coke. I'd have his Diet Coke in the drink holder, ready to go. The night before, I would, I would print the MapQuest directions and have them ready to go. And then at night, I would sell merch like hell to, to prove my value. And then I would do anything and everything I could do to, to stay on the road because I knew that if, if this guy took me off the road, then it was going to be a much tougher situation. Yeah. So then I parlayed <laughs> that into, oh, hey, Steve can headline a few weeks here and there on his own without that headliner. So then again, I took the same approach. If they're going to let me headline, then I know that I should not be eating steaks in the green room. I know that I should not. But you were also, you were smart enough when you say that, like you, you say it like it was so easy. Oh, I just parlayed that into headlining. No, you were smart enough to know that if he's taking you on the road, like I am meeting club owners and managers. And so I need to keep my shit together around I, them. I, I was not, in, right. I was and, not invited to be on the radio. But I knew that if I drove him to radio, mm -hmm. that I would then get to meet those radio DJs. And, I, and even the radio DJs, you know, they would be like, hey, we want McDonald's for breakfast, you know, and, and, and I'd be like, I'll go get it. I'm on it, you know. So those guys would be like, oh, man, Steve's a good guy and Steve hustles and Steve works hard. And, and you know, hey, Steve, if you ever come back as a headliner, we're happy to have you on the radio. So but again, blue collar approach. Yeah. to stand up to where I worked my ass off and for no money. Well, I was going to say, I remember too, like I, I remember there were $50 gigs and there were $75 gigs and I, and you'd be leaving and I'd be like, like, you know, and you'd be like, no, Renee, because I'm going to do this $50 gig and then I'm going to go do this $75 gig. And then later in the week I have this $50 gig and then there's a hundred dollar gig here. And you were like, that all adds up. And and it, and it did. Yeah. So, you know, when I was headlining, I, sometimes I'd only get like two weeks a month. 
So then I was like, okay, I have to hustle those other weeks at the comedy store, you know, where, where if I worked the main room, you know, that would be a $150 check. But then, like you said, boom, I'm scheduling Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. I'm like, I'll get 50 here, another 50 here, 25 here, another 50 here, 75 over here, another hundred here. And man, I was fucking in your head. You're like, how do I make this add up to what I'd be making at a nine to five? Yep. My goal was if, if I could make $500 a week, I could survive, you know? And then my next goal was, okay, I got to make a thousand dollars a week so I could, I could have a better life, you know? Um, and then I meet Renee and well, you know, now it's like, oh crap. Now I'm responsible for Renee. And it was a constant hustle and, and put forth an effort that I was going to make it happen. Yeah. And, and, and I think that's what, what a lot of people lack is the willingness to hustle, to sacrifice and do these are shit gigs, man. You know, I would drive to San Miguel, which was four hours from our house okay. for 400 bucks on a Wednesday. And I would drive four hours there, do the gig, get the 400 bucks, break off an opening act. So it really was um, 300 minus gas. I'm looking at 250 bucks. And then I would drive back that night, get home at 3 a.m. So that you don't have to spend on a hotel room. So I wouldn't yeah. spend money on a hotel room and then wake up in the morning and have to spend money on breakfast. Man, I was making it happen. So... It, it was it was really truly Rick taking a blue collar approach to this is what I want to do and and the sad part is I don't see that well I don't I, see it in other people when you I were, don't see it in other opening acts I don't see opening and then and then the, the opening acts these days you know hey can you help me out and their face tells this story of I don't want to help you I don't want to do that and it's like I did it all. Your attitude when you're talking about all the all the things you did and like how you really did, you would go out there and sell the shit out of their merch for them. Like and and clearly when you're looking at the numbers, like that made them more money. Of course they're gonna keep you around and people, oh, I'm out people there don't barking. think about it like I'm that. out there barking, I'm Helping running the line. the line, I'm taking yeah. pictures, I'm selling merch and, and you know, I'm doing everything I can because I knew that that headliner would keep me on the road if I busted my ass. It was you a know, lack of ego too, though. I didn't have any ego, right? Yeah. There was no ego. Yeah. And, and that was, I mean, there was one time we're in San Jose, California with this said headliner. We're doing two shows Friday. We run out of that, that headliner runs out of merch. We're in San Jose, California. Not only does he tell me you have to close out the show. He won't even let, like, he was like, look, you have to go back to LA and get more merch. And I'm like, okay, I'm down. Whatever, whatever. Yes, sir. I'm on it. Mm-hmm. You got it. No problem. Right. Mm-hmm. And you would think that that headliner would go do your set, bring me up and haul ass. Yeah. No, he was like, not only are you going to do that, you're going to help me sell merch after because I need you. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to drive home. So I started driving to Los Angeles at like one o'clock in the morning. I got there for five o'clock in the morning. I packed all the merch, got it all loaded up turned around and drove back in time to do two more sh- three shows on a Saturday. And by the way, that headliner didn't break me off a dollar extra. The headliner did not give me money for the gas money and the food that I ate. And I didn't say a word. I'm like, I am on it. I got it. Don't even worry about it. I'm your guy. You know, and, and again, it, it, I do agree with you that, that there is a lot of ego and there is a lot of, well, This is, I'm not going to do that. You want me to do what? You want me to sell your merch? Instead, my openers are selling their own merch. Yeah, the the merch table after show is such an interesting, with an opening comic and the headliners always. The opening act selling his own merch, not even helping me out. You know, And, and you would think that these opening acts would go, how do I become valuable to Steve? And, and I'll be honest with you, I'm yet to see it. I'm yet well, to see that. You, that, that I mean, that I remember, yeah. I remember in those early days, you would go over and above probably, I mean, more than, <laughs> probably more than you should have in some instances. There were times you probably should have spoken up and you didn't, you just like zipped it. And I just do it. Bit. I just yeah. do it. You know, so next question, sir. Well, there was a lot to unpack there, but we'll, we'll save some of those questions for the next time, the next go around. But um, Renee, 
given everything that, like, when you're saying that you guys would have a $50 gig that you would leave for a $75 gig, was there ever a time that you ever thought about stopping this dream? Like, maybe this isn't working out? <laughs> Did you see the side eye I just got from Steve? Oh my God. Rick just asked, is there ever a time that I told Steve, hey, maybe this isn't working out. We should do something else. Steve will not let me live that moment down to this day. He still brings it up. Yes, there was a moment. I was working at a kid's acting school, um, working off commission of the cost of admission to the school and it was not cutting it and steve um you were not working there at you, that were, time. you were you were busting you were, your ass too you were nannying at that time i don't think so but you you were busting your ass too and we had moved ourselves into a two-bedroom apartment and steve will say it's because he wanted to make me happy and he can never tell me no and we should not have been living in a two-bedroom apartment paying rent for a two-bedroom apartment in la and uh and we weren't making ends meet and i was like maybe you go get a job at target uh just for a little bit and he, he, he said no he said, no, I am, I am a comedian and I'm going to do comedy full time. And I don't know how, like I look back now and I still don't know how we made it work, but it was the one time I did it and he will never let me live it down. There's so much more to that story, but, <laughs> but I don't, I don't want to dive into to that, but it, it, it did, it did break my heart um, that Renee had come up to, we were, we were in a big fight and Renee had come up to me. She goes, that's it get a job, go work at Target, this is bullshit, and blah, blah, blah. And, and I was like, oh my, no. I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'm, I'm doing stand-up. I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it happen. I don't care what you think. That's it. But I don't want to get into, it, it gets real fucking deep, and I don't want to get into that. But um, yes, there was a time where- I was going to say, that, I, I mean, okay, whatever. I don't, I don't know why we remember it so differently, but- Well, there's just so much more to the story. Than just that yeah but, um okay next question, next question. <laughs> yep. uh steve you and i met on la esquina um la esquina uh the pitbull thing you were writing on it how did you transition from being a comedian stand-up comedian to all the writing credits that you have uh, well I'm, I'm glad you asked that it, it's uh, it, again it was doing whatever i could do to stay in the business um <laughs> we we they have this thing in in Hollywood where they call it the diversity showcase, you know, and I, I hated it. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm I'm talent. I'm I'm talent. I am not Latino talent. I am not Mexican talent. I am just talent. Why do I have to go to this? In my opinion, racist bullshit diversity showcase. You know, and, and it was crazy because it was it was me and um, there's a lot of a lot of people that were on that showcase that now have um, pretty cool careers. And, and I don't want to call them out, but but it was it was annoying to me and I didn't want to do it. And my my agent insisted because they were like, Steve, we're tired of you being difficult. You don't want to go on these auditions. And I'm like, well, I don't want to go on these auditions because you're wanting me to put on an accent. Because every fucking audition you send me on, and I get very passionate about this, every audition you send me on is a fucking stereotype, and I'm tired of the stereotype. I'm tired. I don't want to be that. I want to be a comedian. Why yeah. can't I have and do all the other things that all my peers are doing? Why does everything have to be Mexican Monday, Taco Tuesday, Refried Friday? I was tired I mean, of it. The purpose this diversity showcase was supposed to serve is that we we know, right, there are, especially then, there were not a lot of roles for... Then, still. For um, people of dif different ethnicities. And so this showcase was started so that... Because if there's not a lot of roles, it was, then it was, agents don't make money off that talent, so they no, don't have this was, talent it pool. It was, look, we're not racist. We it, have a diversity showcase. It was the network's yeah. attempt to find this undiscovered so, ethnic talent. Reluctantly, 
I did it because my agency basically threatened me and said that if I don't want to cooperate, that I need to find a new agency. I was lucky to have them as an agency. So I said, okay, fine, I'll do what I got to do. And then we ended up doing this showcase and that's how I got the Alaskina job, which by the way, Rick, I didn't want to do because it was going to take me out of doing stand up. And I don't know if you remember, but I was still going to the comedy club at the Miami Improv when we were doing that. But I became. Kurt Price has got that great interview with you about that. So people should check that out to hear that kind of story. Yeah. And, and you know, ultimately, I, I, I wrote on that show out of survival, out of I have to, because it was a paycheck and it was something really cool. And no offense to Mr. 305, Mr. Worldwide. I, I, I wasn't excited that, oh my God, I get to work with Pitbull. I mean, he wasn't that big of a star. You know, it was it was a paycheck. And I think very much like you, Rick, where, hey, it's a gig, right? Something in the business, let's do it. So writing came out of, out of um, survival and necessity. I always wanted to be a stand-up um, and tour the country as a stand-up and everything else that, that has come along with it has been, um, solely out of survival. Renee, um, we get to see Steve one hour a week or one hour every show. Um, but you know, 10 shows a weekend or whatever you've been doing. Tell us what it takes from your perspective, from the business side to get, from point A to point B. So it starts on a Monday and it doesn't end until the last show on Sunday night. And then you're right back at it on Monday. Can you kind of talk about the business side of it? Yeah. Uh, just like the day to day of the schedule, because he's not working because his job does not entail him to work regular nine to five hours, <laughs> you end up working all of the time because the agents and the managers are working nine to five and they've got questions for you and contracts to look over and um, other business ancillary opportunities that come with being a public figure and a comedian. But then your actual job job when you have to be on starts in the evenings. So they're done with work at five and you're just getting ready to go to go into the office essentially and do your show and your set and you're there working. You're putting in the same hours as you would in a nine to five on the weekends, you know, um, and that doesn't I know I'm like jumping around with your schedule going everywhere, but that's your your travel days. M Monday, Monday, which is today, I, I usually get about a half a day off. I work, I work seven days a week, but Monday's my half a day off, and um, I usually choose to work anyway. I choose to get in the yard, work in the yard, organize, keep things clean and tidy. Well, that, But I, on Mondays, I, agents I, and managers want a recap of the weekend. And then, yeah, I'm getting a phone call from the agents and the managers, and they want a recap of the, of the weekend. They're giving me a heads up as to... Um, other things behind the scenes, yeah, you know, uh, that we're, that we're working on. Renee spends her day with your wife, Gigi, working on, um, our, uh, promotional plans. We're and, looking and at ticket counts, um, ticket counts every couple and are we of days selling tickets and, and, you know, how are the ads running and, and what ads are we going to run this week? And, you know, Renee's in charge of that. I'm talking to agents, managers about, hey, what's, what cities you want to tour next year? When do you want to be here? Um, you know, or, hey, we got... You know, and now it, there's literally 50 offers a week that come in that we have to kind of filter through and go, well, here's a good offer, but let's wait for another offer. And well, here's a good offer, but it's not great, you know, so. Um, and I'm so impressed by your ability to be able to switch from businessman mode to creative mode, because on top of everything else you're funneling and filtering, 
you have to somehow keep the creative juices flowing and write this other set. But, and then that doesn't even talk about all like the things you do philanthropically with helicopters for heroes. And like tomorrow, for instance, we're going down to Corpus Christi to do a new segment with kids at the Ronald McDonald house on a fire truck. And that's driving to Corpus, doing this segment, turning around and driving back to be here to coach baseball in the afternoon with the kids. To, to pick up my son at, at the bus stop. But you know, it, it is what people do not realize, you know, and, and I do get frustrated uh, even in my own neighborhood where people go, well, I don't, I don't work one hour a day, bro, <laughs> Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And I'm like, fuck off, man. I mean, I, I yeah. own several other businesses that I have to keep happy um, and, and be in those meetings and discussions on the creative end. And then I've got to make sure that I'm a good husband to my wife. I got to make sure that I'm a good father to my children and then it's boom, get on a plane, fly out, perform, perform all weekend. And then the green rooms are always entertain the local news, entertain the local radio people. Oh, agents and managers are coming because so-and-so from so-and-so wants to yeah. come see you. We're going to introduce you to this guy or that guy. So the green rooms are always... There's a lot um, of expectation to live up to. It's hard. And, and, and I love it. And, and my hour that I get on stage is my time off. Yeah. That is the hour that I am not working. That is the hour that I'm, man, I'm having a blast. Yeah. I'm making people laugh. I'm enjoying myself on stage. My back doesn't hurt. I'm not tired. I'm not sore. I'm not, you know, thinking about, you know, my kids and my wife and, and finances and um, CPAs. And but I be mean, because there is no, office and that because there is no nine to five kind of parentheses hours that you work you work all the time around the clock and I always laugh because you'll like put something in the schedule but with no notes and I'll look at the calendar and I'll be like okay physically yes that time is open and available, but like the reality of getting there and having time to sleep and making it back and getting to your next obligation. Like, I know you saw that room on the calendar, but I don't know how you're going to pull that off. Well, and, and not to mention the, you know, Tuesdays and Wednesdays when I get scheduled radio, it's radio from eight o'clock in the morning till 2 p.m. And it's a different radio station every 15 minutes. Yeah. And then it's, hey, you have this Zoom interview with this TV station and this TV station. And well, you have you. And then what the shitty part is, it's sometimes it's not. And I try to go, guys, schedule it all fucking one day. But then it's, well, you've got radio on Tuesday till two o'clock. Right. And then at four. This one is live. And you that now one have is a, taped. You and... now have a live Zoom. And it's like, oh, crap, man. I, you know, so now I, 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 my day's fucked because I can't make plans because I have to do that yeah. four o'clock Zoom interview. So it, it's always chaos. It's controlled chaos. We're trying to get better at it. Um, but the, the day to day, week to week is, is always full. And, and the, uh, again, this is, I've said it before on this podcast, this podcast and this hour that me and you get to spend together, it's great because it is uninterrupted. And me and you get to sit down. It's a check-in for us. And have a conversation. Yeah. And enjoy each other. Then you put your makeup on and dress up and look <laughs> nice. Um, all right, Rick. La last question, sir. The juiciest of the juicy. I, I, I kind of want to follow up before I ask this question. Is The one thing of all that chaos you just mentioned, at no point did you talk about writing jokes. Which, if you're not writing jokes, you're not selling tickets. Well, it, yeah, then there's the then there's that too, right? The pressure to deliver um, new material. And, and, and there are stand-ups, uh, and, and again, as you know, I will never name names. There are stand-ups that do the same act year in, year out for years. Yeah. Somehow they still sell tickets. Somehow people still go watch them. I, I have this um, innate feeling inside to at least give the the every show that I do when I come back to Denver, for example, to at least give them 15 to 25 minutes of new material. Um, and then I, yeah, I have to write that. And, and again, the stand up part is the easiest part. 
I was going to say, Rick, as I a, love it. As a member of the team, the the discussion is never that any of us are ever having with Steve is okay. What's the what's the next hour? What have you written? You need to work. You need to write more. Like it's always Steve leading the train, saying, "Okay, I got it. Let's let's film the next special. I'm ready to film the next special." And all the rest of the team trying to like pull together to make that next special happen. Well, and that's not even you know what people don't realize is is when we do film a special, it is months and months and months of 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 you know, Rick coming to us saying, Hey, we got this many cameras. We got to book the cameras. We got to book the cameramen. We got to book that day. We got to, we got to book the venue. We got to make sure that we can shoot it. I mean, there's, you know, that's months of preparation going into shooting the next special. So, you know, it's, it's not one of those things that we go, Hey, next week, let's film a special. No, there's months of, of, uh, preparation going into that. So next question, last question, last question. This is for both of you. If I were to say, what makes you excited about the date October? October what? What makes you excited about the day October 21st? Well, well, I mean, our our wedding. Do you want to say or me? Our wedding anniversary? (laughs) No. How do I know this date and you don't? I guess because I'm I'm PR and marketing over here at Casa Trevino. Um. It is the date we are releasing I Speak Wife, Steve oh, Trevino. Yes, we are going to release I Speak Wife on October 21st, <laughs> but, but it, October 22nd is, is our, our uh, official, unofficial it's our wedding, wedding anniversary. anniversary. Yes. yes. So I'm yes. very excited um, <laughs> to finally, God, man, I mean, people have been asking yes, about Yes, especially I the people that were there at the filming know, in Waco. Uh, we have been through, uh, that's another thing that people behind the scenes you know, finding a home for it, losing that home. This special has been on a journey, a very, very long journey. And I'm so excited for everyone to get to see it. I know you are too. You've been like... I'm so thrilled that people get to see it. And and people have been asking about, man, I missed the I missed the um, bite the leg story. Yeah. Where can I see it? You don't tell it anymore. So the bite the leg story. There are so uh, many great bits on you, I Speak Wife. Me hitting the truck. You wrecking the truck. I mean, the, but again, it, it is a chronicle of my life. And that part of my life is, it feels like forever ago. Yeah. So we're very excited to be You guys have, we had, we had released a couple of clips. So there is stuff from I Speak Wife that is out there, but we're going to be sharing more clips leading up to the actual release. But I Speak Wife is coming out. Um, and we're going to make it simple. And again, we, we debated, we went back and forth. We, we were, we, we had a deal here. We had a deal there. And now I'm like, look straight to YouTube, let the whole world watch it. But I will ask you because we spent a lot of money on this special and we're not getting paid unless you watch it. So please share it, let people know. And most importantly, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Yes. Please go to YouTube right now. Hit the subscribe button. If you are not subscribing to Steve's YouTube channel already, because you, your phone will get pinged. You will get a notification when it is live and out and you can watch it. Um, Aztec Chevrolet, old salt coffee, pick cherries. Thank you so much for your continued support and all of you that continue to watch, continue to support. And and I just want to say before we wrap it up, uh, I'm so grateful for the comments um, that came in this week of people saying, Hey, continue to be honest, continue to be real. And all the people that understand that, that everybody, that we're all human, that we all have good days and bad days. And Renee and I do our very best to be open, honest with our good days, our bad days. Um, and we appreciate the continued support. Please like share, let people know that this podcast exists. Thank you so much. Next time.